Good morning, everybody. It is Sunday morning on January 16th, and it's 8.06 a.m. I'm in a different location. I look far more casual. It's 8.06 a.m. Um, I made another goal to myself this year to continue to unwrap my physical TBR, and that's what we're going to do today. First and foremost, good morning, welcome back, or welcome to my channel if you are new. My name is Kim and I focus on everything in the food writing space. This is food books, not cookbooks, and this can be anything from food history to food culture, anthropology, and environmental sciences. If you haven't already, make sure you've got water nearby. And let's go ahead and get started. Now, first off, I actually unwrapped the first book and then realized I should have done it on camera. So I'm unwrapping two different books to choose one that I'm gonna try and read in an entire day. So the first one I have is Food of a Younger Land by Mark Kurlansky. If you guys don't know, Mark Kurlansky is one of my favorite writers in the nonfiction space. I think he does a really good job of balancing a lot of dense history information with a really interesting narrative. So what is this book about? So the front, I'll just read the front because the back is like three paragraphs of what the book's actually about. Um, it's a portrait of American food before the national highway system, before chain restaurants and before frozen food. When the nation's food was seasonal, regional and traditional from the lost WPA files. I don't know what WPA stands for. Um, so I will have to, oh, Works Progress Administration. So I'm super excited, um, but I admit that I unwrapped this like a week ago and I still haven't actually started it, which is usually a sign that I might not be in the mood to read this. I read a lot of food writing, but I'm still at heart a mood reader. And I think that's why I have almost like analysis paralysis. There's so many options to choose from. This is one of the newer printings of it. I really like the cover. I love that it's orange. It made it a lot easier for me to find it on my bookshelves when I put it down. And I got this at Open Books for $7 used. Okay, now on to the second book. I gave myself a second option. It said Food History on it. Banana, The Fate of the Fruit That Changed the World by Dan Kopel. So I actually can already tell I would rather read just about one item, which is the banana. Um, it's definitely an older edition. I definitely got it from like an indie website. Um, it's, it's loved. I, this, I'm, 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 this sounds ridiculous, but I honestly think I might have bought a newer edition of this book too. And it's somewhere on my shelf, but you can see how old it is just by how um, faded those pages are. So now the goal is going to be, can I find the book as an audiobook? Um, I'm just in the mood for an audiobook. I also, um, I've been super stressed out at work, so sometimes I just need to turn off my brain. So I'm like in a mood to play Stardew Valley for hours and grind and just like work on my little farm. So <laughs> let me see if I can find an audiobook for either of these options. I do know that Mark Karlansky has an audiobook version on Scribed for the Food of a Younger Land. So now let's, let me get back to you guys and find out if I can find Dan Copel's book as an audiobook. As a hardcover, it does come in at 260 pages, so nearly half the size of the Kurlansky book. And when was this one published? Mark Kurlansky's book came out in 2009, and Dan Copel's book came out in 2008, so within the same decade, within a year of each other. I'll be right back. Let's see if we can find this as an audiobook. So good news. I found both books on Scribd, which is awesome. But Dan Copel's book is seven hours and Mark Kurlansky's is 12. So a seven hour book at just regular one speed. If I listen to it at 1.2, which honestly, guys, I've never been able to read faster than 1.2. I can get this done in under seven hours. So that's definitely my pick for the day. And I'll be back when I learn a little bit more about the banana. Hey, I'm back. It's been about an hour. Um, had to take a food break. The cats demanded cat treats. If you're a cat owner, you understand. I wanted to give an update. So I'm on chapter seven. And remember, I'm listening to this at 1.2 speed. Some of these chapters are 10 minutes long before they're even accelerated. So um, I don't want anyone to think I flew too far through it. I've really only been listening for about an hour and change. Um, 
this is my happy place. I definitely love micro history books. I've already learned so many cool facts about the banana that I had to read a couple to you. So the current banana that we eat right now is the Cavendish banana. And our grandparents actually ate something called like the Gros, the Gros Chabelle or Gros Bichel. I'll try and put the spelling here, banana. Um, that banana is already gone and has been wiped out by something called the Panama disease. The, Panam the Panama disease is this disease, it's a fungus that takes over banana crops and can wipe out entire plantations in under a couple of weeks. So that's a downer and it's actually the Cavendish banana is not immune to that blight or that um, Panama disease, it just was resistant a little bit longer. So in the next couple of decades, we could actually lose the banana that we grew up eating. And the only way right now that people have found to fix this problem is to genetically modify the banana. And that doesn't just mean with chemicals, but crossbreeding with other bananas. So bananas grow in a form of cloning, essentially. They just break off, like one banana tree breaks off a hand of bananas, and the process just continues that way, which is why the blight is so dangerous. They're all genetically essentially identical. So that's the current landscape of bananas. But what else did I learn? There are over 1000 types of bananas. A banana is a fruit. The banana tree is an herb. And some bananas are as small as your pinky finger. And some actually have tooth shattering seeds inside of them. So by saying that the banana is a seed, a fruit, think about how often you've eaten a banana. Have you ever seen seeds inside of it? No. Also, we eat bananas upside down. So the part that we're starting where we peel is the end of the banana because it's the last touch point on the vine. So other cool fun fact. Um, there, we use the Cavendish banana because it is consistently the fruit that always takes like seven days to ripen from greens to yellows. Other fun fact is in India, banana is used for as a substitute for tomatoes in sauces and ketchups, which kind of sounds horrifying for my palate, but I'd be willing to try it if someone could make me an authentic dish. I mean, why not? Um, also, one of the chapters actually talked about the role of the banana versus the apple. So we in the US eat more bananas than apples and oranges combined, which is super crazy to think about. I do love bananas. I do love apples. I also live in the Big Apple, you know, New York, things like that. Um, but I definitely don't love oranges. So it was something kind of cool to think about. I also like banana chips, but they're usually coated in sugar, but like a natural dried banana chip. Oh, it's so good. I love that texture. What I also found interesting was actually that the author, um, Copel, takes us back to biblical time and actually makes the case that the Garden of Eden and the apple was actually a banana. And it had something to do with the translation that a banana I wish I like could put the text here. I'll have to like open up the physical book and see if I can find the spellings. But there were two different, a banana, the way a banana was said meant something in one language and in another language that word meant something else entirely. So something about the translation and distillation of information, people took like definition B and eventually the Garden of Eden symbol became the apple. But if we had stayed with definition A, in the original language, the Garden of Eden actually would have been based entirely on a banana. And one of the other points was that in the Bible, when Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, they realize that they are naked and they cover themselves with leaves. I don't know if you've seen an apple leaf. It's not that great. It's pretty small. But banana leaves have historically been used to make clothing and housing and roof items. So there's a little bit more of a case of, oh, well, if I took a banana leaf down from the tree, I could actually fashion myself some clothes. Like, isn't that insane how translation and interpretation completely changed what the Bible and the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden, excuse me, what that experience is, that the term Adam's apple comes from when Adam eats the apple and it gets lodged in his throat banana, banana apple, like Adam's apple, banana, Adam's banana. It's, it's really interesting what could have been, right? Um, and again, I'm not trying to say like, take your religious beliefs however you want. I am just articulating what the book said is that somewhere in translation, it could have been the Garden of Eden full of banana plants. 
I'm also now going to look on Wegmans to see Wegmans or Whole Foods to see if I can try a different type of banana because I was actually just in the grocery store yesterday and there's only really one banana. It's the Cavendish, but more and more these smaller varieties of bananas are making their way to the US at a much higher premium, which makes sense. It's, it's a demand, it's economies of scale. Uh, but now I'm really, really curious to see if I can find one of those bananas uh, that's coming out of Thailand. And I am so sorry that my camera is like auto focusing that some days I'm, I'm bright and, and then at other moments I look really dark. Um, there's no light directly above me. It's all behind me. So, you know, throughout this vlog, I'm just going to keep changing colors and I hope you can forgive me. See, I did it right now. Whatever. Anyway, onward. More bananas. Hey everyone, it's Kim. It's been a couple of hours since you've last seen me. I am through parts one, two, three, and now four of Banana by um, Dan Koppel. So I really think part one was my favorite, which is the straight up history and factoids of the banana, um, things that I mentioned in the earlier clip. Now I've gotten through parts two, three, and four, and we start to get more into the politics and rapid expansion of the banana as a global food item. And this area, transparently, I have already read a little bit about the history of bananas because in 20, gosh, in 2020, I read The Fish That Ate the Whale, The Life and Time of the Banana King, which is about Sam the Banana Man, who was a huge um, driving force on bringing bananas to the United States. I mean, the guy was so important, it, influential more than important. He staged a political coup just so he could not have to pay taxes to ship bananas into the United States. Um, so if you are very interested in how food and politics intersect, especially um, with bananas, I highly recommend that book as your next step reading. So if I had read this book before I read The Life and Times of the Banana King, I think I would have enjoyed this section of the book a lot more. Um, but because I already had that context part, I was like, yeah, 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 I know this, I know this, I know this, which is fine. Like that's just, you know, there's no, the thing about food writing is that unless you're reading an annual publication, there's no direct path on how you follow your food writing books. Um, this is a great example of if I had been reading this for the first time, I would have gone, oh my God, I need to learn more about Sam the Banana Man and found another book, which would have led me to um, The Fish That Ate the Whale. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind. So I have about three hours left of the book that I'm going to still try and bang out today. It's Sunday, it's four o'clock. I'm going to do a load of laundry. Um, Dan and I went out for lunch and we actually um, hit up a couple of other little free libraries, which will be a different video. I'm not sure which one will come up first, but so please make sure you go check that out in the cards. Um, we dropped off about, I'd probably say about a dozen books into a couple other little free libraries. So let's try and finish it out today. I've got to film a clip for Rosie for one of her videos and we'll get back to reading. I'll check in with you guys soon. Hi there, I'm back. It has been quite a few days uh, since I actually finished reading this book. So I did officially finish Banana, The Fate of the Fruit That Changed the World by Dan Koppel actually last Sunday. Um, and I will completely admit I have been waiting for some bananas. So I did pick up a Cavendish banana. This looks like the banana we're all used to seeing. And then I did pick up these new, a new type of banana, which was referenced in the book. These are coming out of Thailand and they're quite literally called, I think, little hands or little fingers. I'll put the name up here if I can find it. And one of the things I want to make clear is that this is not a, a dwarf version of a Cavendish. This is actually quite literally a different type of banana. Um, as you'll see, I've had both of these bananas for a week and the Cavendish, which is bread, not to bruise, really hasn't bruised, but this new banana does bruise because we haven't quite, we being the world, um, this banana is hopefully meant to be one of the types that will replace the Cavendish, which keeps dying from the Panama disease and other infections. But right now this banana really hasn't been genetically modified in any way to deal with some of the rough and tumble of transportation. Now there's a lot of debate around the world of gen genetically modified foods, um, which I could do a whole other video on and I won't get into here. But one of the big things is that there are different countries all over the world, a lot of Europe that is starting to ban genetically modified foods. 
which is great. We want to have a world outside of monocultures where these fruits and vegetables can still exist in nature, but in a world where we want a banana that looks perfect on shelf, these little guys aren't gonna cut it unless they have some kind of modification done to them. So I'm not gonna eat the Cavendish on camera because I think everyone knows what a banana tastes like, hopefully. So I'm just gonna open this little guy up um, in the book, it was described as almost a mix between a, almost like an orange, not in flavor, but in texture. And already, like, I can just tell this is very um, different looking. Fibrous wise, my cat is like freaking out that I have a banana and I'm not quite sure why because cats are carnivores. Peachy, it's a banana. Banana. <laughs> anyway, um, I just want to open up the Cavendish so you can kind of see the textural differences. Maybe maybe they look exactly the same to you, but they they look different to me. This looks drier, starchier maybe, um, closer to the pulp-like structure of a orange. Would you like a banana? Would you like to come on camera? Oh, meow! Oh, hello? No, no banana. Oh, so she meows about the banana. I show her the banana and she runs away. Anyway. It even breaks differently. I don't know how else to explain this. It's definitely different. It's definitely a different banana. I, I am not a food um, critic. I'm not very good at articulating the differences in food, but this definitely has a starchy and more fibrous texture to it. Like when I bit into it, I could. I could hear some of the fibrous strands like breaking under my teeth, which is kind of strange. It's also these bananas cost nearly a dollar more per banana than this guy did, the traditional Cavendish that we already buy. Yeah, it's just, it's just gentler. All in all, the banana could very well go extinct in the next 20 years. The Cavendish specifically can go extinct in the next 20 years because we have not found a way to cure blight and the Panama disease without throwing tons and tons of chemicals on top of our food, which is the issue when you monoculture and you rely on one variety of a fruit or a vegetable. I found the book very interesting. My favorite parts were definitely the food history towards the beginning of the book versus more of the uh, agriculture and globalization and distribution of the banana, but it's a really good book. It's a little over 10 years old now, and I'm sure there will be more banana books coming out in the future. It's fun to, fun to say more banana books. Sorry if you can hear my washer behind me. But all in all, this was a really great example of unwrapping a book on my TBR. I'm really glad I did it. And make sure that if you wanna see more of my foodie bookish content, you hit like and subscribe below. And I am still crowdfunding for the Read It and Eat subscription box program and my business platform. Um, we're very close to $3,000, about a fifth of the way done. And this campaign will run for another about 50 plus days by the time this video goes up. So please consider donating. And if not, it's quite all right. But the more you can help spread word of mouth about the campaign, that would be greatly appreciated. I hope you're well, wear a mask, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.